I'm Steph. And I'm Jeff. Each week, we review a film that's streaming online. As writers, we'll deep dive into the characters and plot to tell you if it's a good story. Listen at your own risk. This review contains spoilers. Now sit back. Relax. And and enjoy enjoy Stream On. Today, we'll be reviewing Aliens, streaming on Amazon. In this sequel to Alien, Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, arrives on Earth decades later. Traumatized and ostracized, she is recruited for a mission back to LV-426. Once there, she and a squad of space marines find the human colony has been overrun by aliens. Will Ripley survive again, or will she wind up as a host to an alien embryo? Not much of a mystery, given this is a 40-year-old movie with two sequels, both starring Sigourney Weaver. Aliens was written and directed by James Cameron, and it's based on the original Alien movie. It's a sequel to the 1979 sci-fi horror film Alien, No S. The film stars Sigourney Reaver as Ellen Ripley, the sole survivor of an alien attack on Nostromo, Michael Bean as Dwayne Hicks, a Marine Corporal, Paul Reiser as Carter J. Burke, a Wayland yutani corporate representative, Lance Henriksen as Bishop, the android aboard the ship, Carrie Han as Rebecca Newt Jordan, a young girl in Hadley's Hope Colony, aka LV-426, that is a survivor, and Bill Paxton as Private Hudson, a private that freaks out a lot about the aliens. Game over, man. Game over. Yeah, this this movie has so many good one lines. So, Jeff, you chose this film. Why did you pick this classic? So, I had basically two reasons for picking this. First, it is a great action film and one of the best examples of military science fiction cinema. There is almost nothing wrong with it. It's well paced, has really amazing practical special effects, good acting. Even the secondary characters are well-developed, and some of them are more cliched than others. We can get into that a bit, but even those are at least memorable. The other reason I picked this, so this is a really wonderful example of how you make a sequel. You take, in this case, an existing world and then go completely sideways into a completely different genre. You go from survival horror that was you know alien into basically uh, space marines and stuff, and... James Cameron nails that completely. This film is a masterpiece on many levels. Is it better than the original Alien? I know this is hotly debated. The two films I think are so different that they're both masterpieces in their own right. I mean, both, and and I don't mean that just like kind of a, a fanboy thing. Both are extremely well acted. Both have great effects and in their own way, groundbreaking effects. Both have a very interesting look and a kind of immersive universe that you're immediately dumped in, but seems real. Both have very well-paced stories, but the genres are so different in the way they're played out that it's hard for me to say that one is just better than the other. I think they're both great. That is a nice, neutral answer, Jeff. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, um, so let's jump into our plot analysis. So as a writer, what would you like to point out about Aliens? Well, the first thing, and this is going to be a fairly obvious one, but how do you make a really strong protagonist? And in this case, how do you make a strong female character? That may not seem as germane today, because of course, fiction is replete with strong female characters these days. But when this film was made, this kind of action heroine was really not that common. You definitely had some of it, but you tended to, if you're looking at kind of the female action leads, like in, especially like in the 70s, that was more exploitation films, right? Right. And this came out, what, early 1980s? This was 86. Okay, so it's so a mid- little later in the 80s, but still Sigourney Weaver's character was, you know, not just a you know, kick-ass action hero. But because of both the writing and the acting, she able, was able to give some depth to her 
And when she interacts, for example, with Newt, it's in a very believable way. It's There's a bit of a mothering instinct there, but there's also a nice little distance because, you know, it's not her daughter. Her daughter actually has died from old age while she was in hypersleep. And I, I think that is a good way to write any character with multiple layers and a very distinct character arc. I don't know. I, th- I think Cameron Ditch did a really good job with this, and particularly at that time of getting a character who was a little, you know, not... The action hero, the male hero, was much more of a standard than this, and he does a great job with that. I think I agree with you. Ripley is a good example of how to write a strong female protagonist. Uh, She carries the movie on her own, and there's, you know, some wonderful scenes that are very feminist about basically it shows... Uh, the, the males around her not listening to her and really suffering the consequences of not listening to her. She's got a lot of knowledge and expertise about these aliens from her, you know, movie number one, her past experience, and they don't believe her, they don't listen to her, and as a result, they, you know, end up in these kerfuffles. Um, and, you know, true to life, she has to work harder than the males to get her voice heard um, even above the cowardly lieutenant um, and the corporate scumbag that they seem to be listening to more than her. And uh, we know, we can tell from the very beginning, the corporate scumbag character is not going to be good news. Um, with, with Carter J. Burke, we know he doesn't have their best interests at heart. Um, and so, but it shows, I, I think, what a lot of females still have to deal with today not just in the 1980s but that they have to work twice as hard to get their voice heard that often they have good things to say but they're not being listened to and so the consequences happen as a result so while this is set on an alien planet in a sci-fi universe he does a good job in writing this character of showing uh what strong female protagonists or strong females in general have to deal with in life and so I I really liked how that was showcasing what it like mirrors what happens on planet earth as well this film does a nice job of taking that core character who's shown to be kind of tough and conf- competent like any of the guys around her and in fact more competent and have a better survival skill than the original crew because they're all killed and then giving her a surrogate daughter or even explaining that she's you know right and and it just she is nurturing towards newt right she's badass but she's also nurturing and it, that was well played uh, there's this one scene where um she's uh it has the doll or the remnants of the doll right with newt and she's like you know trying to use the doll to comfort her and newt's like this doll is fake <laughs> Like it was just it was uh, it was a really like natural scene that showed the nurturing, but showed also the limitations of her nurturing. Well, and there's it's interesting too. Now this is not a huge component of this film, but in the original movie, the character is fairly desexualized. What I mean by that is there's like no flirtation with her and other characters. I think there was a scene that was cut where she was supposed to be having sex with. Uh, Dallas, who is the commander of the Nostromo, okay? But that was cut out, so I don't care about scenes that are cut. We do get a little, like, flirtation between her and Hicks in this movie. Mm-hmm. It's it's fairly subtle, but it's there. So it's like, it's an interesting way to take a character and, you know, give her some added facets that weren't there initially, but ones that work really organically and actually make her grow. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to, again, why this is such a great movie, because... Our protagonist has changed a bit, but is still recognizable as the first person, still recognizes the original character. And then those changes actually add to her growth, having an arc in the story. Well, yeah, because part of that nurturing is she made a promise to Newt that she wasn't going to leave her behind because she easily could have and just cut it as a loss given, you know, like she had to go through a pretty dangerous thing to Re- re-rescue Newt, right? Um, but it it showed that she is true to her word and that she cared enough about her surrogate daughter to come back for her. Um, and that was that, that strong mama instinct um, that, you know, they, it, it just did a really good job balancing the nurturing with the badass. Yeah. 
And again, it, it, it takes both a good writer and a good actor to do that. Mm-hmm. And obviously both Cameron and, and uh, Weaver do a really good job with it. Is there anything about Ripley that, since we're on her, is there anything about her that you don't like? And I'll just preface by saying, I think she's a great character and there's nothing particularly about her I dislike, but is there anything that you saw in this character that didn't sit with well with you or thought was a misstep or did you just like her? No, I, I thought she was really well crafted. I'm looking through my notes to see if there's anything. Um, but no, I, I think she did a really good job and it was a well constructed character that went somewhere. Uh, I wasn't bored by her character. Uh, yeah. Yeah, overall, I think well written. Well, I, I think this goes to one thing as a writer. And, and this is why Ripley actually is a great example of how you construct your tags in general. Is you want somebody with, you know, very strong identifiable traits, but you don't want to make them caricatures. They could have made her, go, you know, go way overboard with like the surrogate mom thing, right? And like all weepy and stuff. And she or do I or, know best about the aliens. If you want something right, do it yourself. I mean, right. we uh, uh, or we eventually got there, right? Where she is the one that has to take over because the lieutenant failed. But she let them fail. She allowed them to have their, you know, the Marines the chance to do their job. Uh, and she like tried to warn them, but she did it in like a very diplomatic way. And then eventually when once things crumbled, she's like, okay, yeah, now, now let me step in and do my thing. Uh, but yeah, they didn't go too over the top with that. Right. And like I said, for any writer out there, that's what you want for your protagonist in general. Mm-hmm. So the other thing that I thought was really interesting was um, how Cameron took an established world and then saw it through a very different lens. And I, you know, we alluded to this earlier. Well, I stated it earlier and allude to it. We're Alien, the original film, is much more survival horror, and this is a lot more of a military SF film. Mm -hmm. It's a rescue mission. Yeah. This is a, I mean, this is an amazing example of how you take a existing property, an existing story, and do something original with it while not betraying the original in any way. It still has that kind of dark, grungy, you know, future feel to it. Everything looks... Well, it looks like some sort of weird industrial vision of what the future would be like. It's not Star Trek where everything's clean and shiny. The best you get is like on the Sulaco, the military spacecraft, where it's just like kind of austere, like a warship, right? Everything else looks run down, grungy, used. It's like if the 90s grunge mu- movement like was transferred way into the future. <laughs> That's yeah. how I feel things would look. Yeah, and that ke- that's in keeping with the look – and feel from the original film while Cameron expands on that. He adds, for example, he adds the whole idea of the alien queen mm-hmm. because the life cycle in the original film, although it's not, this is again, one of those scenes that was cut out, but we do see a sequence in one of the cut scenes where a couple of crewmen are turning into eggs as opposed to an alien queen laying them. And Cameron was like, well, we need a bigger bad. Mm, and since sure. this wasn't we on need screen, a mama alien. Well, and it works though because it, it, it both helps to um, create a new level of threat. So it's not just these, you know, regular alien killing machines. You got this giant alien killing machine coming after you. And it also helps kind of expand the world, but in a way that doesn't break anything with the original film. You know, a lot of films, when you start to do sequels and things like that, it is a temptation to break canon, to break the world that was really set up as opposed to just enhancing it Mm -hmm. and this again is much like with ripley being a great example of a protagonist this is a great example of how you take that established world and do something different with it sequels are challenging i would say that more sequels are poorly executed than well executed that it's it's more of an exception to the rule to get a sequel that is just as good or better than the first um and, and this is on par with the first movie what did you think of Private Hudson's character? I would say if there's something that kind of annoyed me about this film, it was his character. I mean, he was the scared sidekick, and it was very tropey in the movie, but I just, this, we are all going to die, it, it just got to be, for me, a little annoying and overkill. I felt it was overacted. 
um, by Paxton's character, by Paxton as an actor. What are your thoughts about Private Hudson? See, now I disagree with that. I thought Bill Paxton did a really nice job as this guy who is like super cocky and has probably, you know, he's seen the shit time after time and always been able to handle it, always know with a stupid joke, and now he's facing something he's never seen before. And as he says, he's short, so he's about to get out of the Marine Corps. And this is like his last operation, and it's on Alien Death World. I thought he added some nice little bits of comic relief, and I think that's part of the reason the character's there. He gets some of the best kind of comedic lines. He also, though, and this is another strength of this movie, as a secondary character, he does have his own mini arc. Because he starts off as this guy who's, you know, really cocky, and then it seems to get almost shrill, right, as he's talking about we're all going to die and blah, blah, blah. Mm Mm-hmm. But at the end, he kind of pulls his stuff together and goes down as a hero, you know, fighting. He goes down as someone who's really kind of gotten everything wired tight again. He's doing his job again. And in part because uh, uh, Ripley won't put up with his shit. I think even she, there's a line where she's like, I'm not going to put up with your shit kind of thing. And he kind of gets back into what he needs to do. Yeah, I think it was just the amount of it. We're all going to die. I, I think it was, there was just, I would have toned it down slightly, but still gotten the same vibe. Just a personal opinion, though, about how the character's written. It's a minor thing. It's not anything that I think destroys the viewability of this film. It, you wouldn't have lost anything essential by toning it down just a notch. Uh, I will say, and if this isn't clear at this point, I'll just make it really clear. I love this movie so much that at times it is hard to be completely objective about it. <laughs> I've seen this film probably 30, 40 times. I love it. There, It is like the quintessential action SF movie. So it's sometimes hard for me to go, oh, it's like, no, no, no. Every single line is perfect. It's like, it's like it'd be the next book in the Bible after Revelations. It's the <laughs> book of Cameron. It's just lines from this movie. That's what it is. Okay, like, so when you said you weren't a fanboy earlier, I think I, I might, uh, we might edit that. <laughs> um, so I do have a question for you. Since you have seen this movie so many times, and I've only seen it a few times, what does Stay Frosty mean? It's a cool line. I kind of want to use it at some point in like random conversation. Uh, maybe I'm signing off of a Teams meeting at work and I'll say, stay frosty. I don't know. It's a cool line. But what do you think it means? Oh, I think it just means like stay calm, stay cool, stay collected. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like the context is like, okay, we have a, there's only a few of us left because it's near the end when he says this, right? And I think they're setting up the smart guns and the barricades and everything as the aliens are about to overrun their last little, um, Redoubt and who is it? Hicks is like, okay, stay frosty to like the few surviving Marines. I think it's just like, stay on your task. Don't freak out. Don't get excited. Stay calm. Stay cool. Oh, gotcha. I was thinking it meant like, watch your six, like, stay frosty, stay alert, watch your six, like, make sure you're like aware of what's around you. Like, like, stay a little like cold so you're alert. I don't know. Like, I bet it's a cool line, whatever it means. This movie has so many great lines. I mean, so what's your favorite since you've seen oh this 30 plus times? Well, let's see. I, I have a couple. Um, obviously, okay, there's an obvious one that has launched a thousand memes. We need to pull back and nuke the site from orbit. It's the only way to be sure. I, I love that one. <laughs> um, there's a great exchange between uh, Hudson and Hicks. Uh, Hud- I'm sorry, Hudson and Ripley. And this is one of your raw going to die moments. But uh, Ripley is talking to... Hudson and she's like, you know, this little girl survived on this planet with no weapons and no training. And Hudson's like, well, why don't you put her in charge, man? And they're like, that's awesome. <laughs> so that is one thing about this movie, though, is that in addition to the really interesting characters and world and plot and everything, the script is really well written. I don't think that there's any particular wasted lines. It's it's not a short film. And there's a lot that happens, but everything, all the character interactions are basically either do a good job of establishing who these people are, or they move the plot forward in a very interesting and understandable way. I mean, I don't know. I mean, so clearly you thought the Hudson character was a bit over the top and that it was a bit too much for the tone of the rest of the film, that he's a little too jokey. Is there anything else like that, though, that you felt didn't work that well? That's really the main thing was Hudson's character that stuck out to me. The thing with Burke 
was predictable, um, but it was fine for what it was. We needed sort of the slimy corporate guy trying to sabotage things, right? Like that helped move the story along and was a good plot device. So I felt it worked. Um, One thing about his death too that I thought was really well done, it shows why Cameron is a great filmmaker. You don't actually see him die. That's true. You know that he... So this is after the final, final firefight, right? And he has sealed himself in the room while Ripley and Newt are banging on the door to try to get in. The last couple of Marines are falling back. And there's an alien there. But when they finally get in that room, the alien's gone, Burke's gone. There's no, like, you know, headless corpse or anything. Mm -hmm. There is a cut scene, which I'll just bring up. Now, this this has not been released in uh, any version of the film. There is actually an extended version of the film, which has some stuff like at the beginning and all that, and we get a little bit more about Ripley and her daughter. There is a cut scene, though, from the end of the movie where Ripley is going through the reactor complex to find uh, Newt. And she finds Burke uh, epoxied up into the wall. Oh, and she fun. And he's like, kill me. And she hands him a grenade. And if you listen carefully in the actual theatrical cut, you can hear an explosion. And there doesn't seem any reason for it. And that's why it's him blowing himself up. Uh, you have to be a true fan to know that level of depth. I, I actually found it on YouTube because I, I had heard, I'd read about it. And so I was like, hey, YouTube has everything. And it does. So I went and found it. I was like, oh, this is awesome. But I like the fact he, in the f- film we get, set aside, that we don't see it. And that's a, I like that as a choice by the filmmaker. This This is like, it's actually creepier because... You see the terror on Paul Reiser's face as you see the alien's mouth opening, and that's it. Yeah, you don't need it. You can right. just you because at that point the character served his purpose, and we can move forward. I mean, he he helped basically. He was there to motivate the mission to begin with. Okay, well let's um take this to wrap up then. So what was your favorite scene? And you cannot say the entire movie, Jeff. You have to pick something. Oh, sure. Uh, it's a tie for me between the very high tension initial exploration of the facility. So when our heroes first land on the planet and they're, this is before we've seen the aliens and they're going through the uh, apparently abandoned facility and it's extremely well shot. There's a nice fake out with uh, where they finally find, it, it ends when they find Newt and there's a nice fake out there because you're like, oh, is this an alien? And it's like, no, nah, it's a little kid. So that is really well done for a non-action sequence. And then the final firefight, and by the final, I mean the one where uh, the aliens are, uh, you know, the famous scene where they're coming through the ceiling and you have just madness. It's just like everyone's shooting, there's aliens mm-hmm. dropping all over the place. And it's just like an amazingly exciting sequence. It's like, it's a great action sequence. It's not a high octane one. It's not like some uh, post 2000, uh, born identity kind of movie where you have a zillion jump cuts and all that stuff, but it's, it's incredibly well shot and just a well done action sequence. So how about you? What's, what's your favorite scene? Ripley plus flamethrower versus mama alien. I mean, this is a classic scene of this film, but I, I really loved that tense standoff right where where ripley's walking by and then she sees mama alien and all her little pods and then one pod opens uh and it's all hell breaks loose it's great it did that tension right before the hell breaks loose is is perfect and then yeah it's just great to see ripley kicking alien butt what's your least like scene so i had two um, well, one is a specific scene, and that's the uh, fake out at the end with Bishop in the atmosphere processor. I know everyone's seen this movie, but basically it's that scene where Ripley and Newt are being chased by the um, alien queen, and they run it onto this uh, deck, and they're expecting Bishop, the android, to be there with his drop ship to take them off. He's not there, but then he shows at the last minute. Eh, it was okay. It it actually worked better, I think, then. It's been done so many times since then in so many movies that it's become kind of a, oh, this is a kind of a silly little fake out. One of the plot issues, though, I did actually have one, and that is this, is that it's established that 
the colony, that they had time to perform at least some surgeries, that they were able to remove some of the face huggers, so the things that implant the embryos into the humans. But at no point they sent a message back with exactly what was going on, because all we hear from Burke is that there was a notification they found some sort of like derelict, and then communications were cut off. But it seems like more time passed when the aliens were overrunning the colony. It's not a big thing. It's a little world-building thing. It definitely doesn't detract from my liking of this movie. But if we're looking for worse scenes, it's between those two things. See, I took it as more information was, but Burke purposely misheld that information because he wanted to do this mission. So I, I took it as more that they just weren't getting all the information that Burke had. I, I guess the way I approach something like this is that I, I completely understand that. I, I can certainly see that interpretation. There's, I'm definitely not saying that there's anything wrong with that. When I review things like this, I do tend to look at like what's on screen. Gotcha. And okay. how, you know, it's like we're told on screen that they had time. We see, you know, they're in this lab and there's like multiple alien face huggers, and we're told they had time to perform surgeries to remove these pe- these face huggers from people. But we never really see where they're like, oh, why didn't they say we got these weird alien life forms? Now your explanation makes sense. But yeah, we don't uh, we don't have a scene where right. we see the like a big reveal where Burke knew that information to tie right. that together. So that's all. Also, I, I have to say, I had to dig deep to find a worse scene in this or a worse idea. I figured. I was like, Jeff's gonna say nothing. Um, okay, so for me, uh, it, my worst scene um, was when Ripley had provided sufficient evidence to the rest of the crew that Burke is a scumbag. And basically was trying to get her impregnated with a face sucker alien to, you know, whatever for his corporate evil reasons. And no one's believing her. Like at this, to me, this just got old. At this point, like she had proven herself correct multiple times by now. And this no one's listening to Ripley got old. Uh, And so that was frustrating to me. I get that they're kind of... I think they were trying to make a feminist point about how many times a woman has to speak up before the men around her listen to her. Like, I get the point they were trying to make, but it just got old at that point. I will say I don't disagree with what your assessment. Well, and it sure at least like seeing, so obviously, whatever you didn't like. The only thing I do want to point out, though, is that they go from, right, questioning her to believing her in the same scene. Right. Because remember, I think it's like she's like, um, what was it? I think it's um, Hicks is like, well, even if they were impregnated, they being Ripley and Newt, he's like, well, we would know that you're impregnated. And he's and she's like, yeah, well, he's going to have to sabotage all your sleep couches. And then they're like, they're like oh, yeah, he's going to kill us. Great. And at that point, they meet, they turn against him. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. By that time, she has basically been running the show for a while anyway and for them to doubt anything about burke is just like it's just like a it's a it's an added moment that isn't really that necessary yeah it just wasn't believable unless you know you're really trying to make a statement about just feminism in sure. general and just the the amount of effort that you know ripley had to do to make her voice heard amongst all the males she was around uh, okay, well, um, I think I know exactly where how you're going to rate this film, Jeff, but zero out of five pandas, what would you give this one? I'm giving this five facehugger pandas, which are the cutest and yet creepiest things you can possibly imagine. This is a perfect science fiction action film. Man, this is just a great film in general. I really don't feel like I need to go over this again since I've already gushed about it, but yeah, if you want to see a great movie... And definitely a great science fiction action film. You have to watch this if you haven't. And if you had, watch it again. How about you? I'm close to you. Four and a half out of five. This is classic sci-fi. One of the rare movie sequels. It's, I would argue, better than the original. I know it's very different, but I like this one a little bit more than the original Alien. Uh, has a great female protagonist. Awesome looking aliens. A few good jump scares. Uh, I mean, it's... This is a great film. It lost a half a point because of uh, Private Hudson's whiny, we're all going to die character. Um, But other than that, great film. Okay. And I'm going to figure out how to 
stay frosty. Okay. (laughs) Okay, what do we have next week, Jeff? So next week, we'll be reviewing Arrival, currently on Amazon. Stream On is a production of Steph and Jeff Wrights Media. Reproduction without written consent is prohibited. All rights reserved, 2021.